many of us do not need an uh, introduction to Marcus Schaefer. Marcus came to uh, CDM in 1999 as an assistant professor of computer science. Uh, he finished his PhD at the University of Chicago uh, and he got his master's degree in, in mathematics and computer science at uh, the University Karlsruhe in Germany. I hope I sp spelled it right uh, or pronounced it right. Um, uh, Marcus is uh, our graph theory guru, as I can say, <laughs> uh, and complexity theory guru and the theory person. Uh, uh, and he has published extensively uh, in, in numerous conferences and journals. So over to Marcus. Thank you, Tana, for the introduction. Um, you will not have to look at me. I will share my screen with you. Tana, I can do that, I suppose? Yes, yes. So you will be seeing the pictures I prepared for you instead of my instead of my face. Is that working? Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay, very good. So, oops. Uh, I need to find my laser pointer. Hold on. There we go. Okay. Thank you again for the introduction. I will be talking about uh, exist R or the real logic of drawing graphs. When Tanya sent out the announcement, she made it sound like it'll be a general introduction to graph drawing. Unfortunately, I won't be able to do that. I'll do a little bit of that, but I'll really focus on this um, complexity class ER that we introduced and uh, I'll try to position it um, and to do that, I have to talk to you about three different things. So I'll try to do a, a um, relatively slow general introduction before I get to the more uh, technical parts. And uh, this complexity class combines three different areas. There is uh, graph drawing. I have that symbol up on the top left here. That's a drawing of a K8. So you have eight vertices and you have all the edges between them. This is from a 16th century um, uh, logic text. Then at the bottom you have logic, uh, so in the Principia Mathematica notation, and the third uh, third area that comes in here is computational complexity. Because I'm not assuming that we do have a lot of faculty in here, which is good, and I think uh, Adam and James uh, and uh, Tana will probably know most of the technical stuff, but for the students or the faculty that um, don't, let me just do a slow introduction for what I'm talking about here. By the way, at any point, uh, unmute yourself and you ask questions. I, I work best when I'm interactive, so don't hesitate to, to interrupt me when I'm saying things that don't make sense or uh, that could need explanation. So here's the uh, beautifully drawn K8 in a style that we don't really do anymore, where the edges are actually cutting through each other's like uh, ribbons and the vertices are very fat. This is, um, this is a nice visualization of our K8 and graph drawing, which I'm going to talk uh, to you about now, is kind of the theoretical underpinning of information visualization. So the tools that you need to do nice uh, um, information visualizations. It started, the, the graph drawing theoretical part, start with the notion of um, planarity. I will kind of assume that you know what a graph is. So we have vertices, we have edges between them. You call a graph planar if it can be drawn in the plane without any crossings, like we have this graph here. You have the vertices placed in such a way that the edges between them are drawn as uh, line segments and there are no crossings uh, in this drawing uh, whatsoever. Uh, most of you probably when they think of graphs, actually think of graph drawings because we visualize graphs very naturally by drawing them. But the graph is actually an abstract object. This is really what, um, we would call a topological graph or a graph um, drawing. Uh, this graph has a name, it's typically called K5 minus E because it's a complete graph on five vertices having all the edges between the vertices with the exception of one edge. You see there is no edge between this vertex and um, that vertex here. If you're trying to add that edge, things get a bit um, uh, uh, non-planar. Uh, what you see here is that we can, we can still draw the graph clearly. Uh, but it requires a crossing here at this uh, point and any other 
way you attempt to draw this graph will lead to at least one crossing, probably, uh, probably more. So we would say K5 is a non-planar graph. It inherently cannot be drawn with any crossings in the uh, plane. That was realized sometime in the 19th um, century by uh, probably by Möbius, who gave us the Möbius strip. And there's an old puzzle by Dudeney, which you may know as the water gas electricity puzzle, uh, where you have three houses uh, called ABC and you're supposed to connect them by pipes to three resources, water, gas, electricity, in such a way that the pipes don't overlap. Now, if you've never seen this puzzle, it's actually fun to try, except for I'll have to tell you it's not actually possible. Uh, without overlapping the pipes, unless you cheat, which Dudeney did in the original solution. He actually let one of the pipes to one of the houses, in which case you could do it. But if you don't cheat, then there is no solution. And the way we would phrase this in graph drawing is a saying that the K33, if you have a bipartite graph with three vertices on one side, three vertices on the other side, and you try to draw all the connections, that graph is also non-planar. It requires at least one crossing. Uh, this came together then in Koratowski's theorem published in 1930. This is from the actual paper. These two graphs I just showed you, the K5 uh, drawn, he actually thought of these as three-dimensional um, simplices. Uh, the K5 and the K33 are non-planar and they are essentially the only obstructions to planarity. You can draw the graph in the plane if it doesn't contain a K33 or K5. As a topological manner, I'll skip the details. I'm not 100% precise here. But what it means is we can actually recognize planar graphs relatively easily by just looking for these obstructions um, in them. That doesn't yet mean that we can draw the graph in a planar way. That's a different um, task, but there are algorithms um, for this. So the area of graph drawing, as I said, underpins information uh, visualization. One of the first questions that was asked was, um, is the graph planar? Once you know that it is planar, say, you may want to know how to place the vertices and then how to draw the edges. When I say how to draw the edges, say in this graph over here, all the edges are drawn as straight line segments, but there's nobody that forces you to do that, right? There could be arbitrary curves, there could be um, actually one style of drawing that people have looked at recently are so-called uh, Lombardi drawings, where they're drawn as uh, circular arcs. So in that case, um, uh, you get a different notion of uh, drawing. And there's many of these. So graph drawing looks at visualizing graphs under certain conditions, and then it sets different goals. For example, uh, you may want to minimize the number of crossings. So we saw that K33 and K5 can be drawn with one crossings, but a general graph that requires uh, crossings, what's the smallest number of such crossings? Um, this has been investigated. Apparently, the number of crossings is very strongly related to people being able to read or understand the information in the graph. So minimizing that is important to convey information. Something else people have realized is you have crossings. You want the angles between the crossing edges to be large, as large as possible, because then it's easier to trace where the endpoints are. If you have an angle that's uh, less than a right angle or it's very um, small, then it's hard to distinguish the edges and find the endpoints. So people have looked at right angle drawings which are drawings where all the um, crossings happen at right angles or um, this is called resolution drawings with large resolution where the angles are at least a certain uh, degree. Or you may limit the slopes that are allowed to draw the edges if they're straight line edges. Or the edges may have to have a certain length, right? If this is encoding some salesperson problem, say, then there may be a length or cost associated with an edge, and you may want to have the, the actual length uh, of, in the drawing reflect that cost, so you may prescribe the edge length. So this is, uh, this is as much as I will do as an overview of graph drawing, uh, unfortunately to give you a, a bit of an idea of what people work um, in there. Uh, let me make maybe one or two more comments about crossing number because that will come um, back to us and it's one of the topics I've been um, looking at in quite some depth. So as I said earlier on K5 and uh, K33 here on the right, this is the gas water electricity problem, right? You can think of uh, the yellow vertices being ABC and the blue vertices being gas, water, electricity. So both these graphs can be drawn with a single crossing. 
if you take the usual convex drawing, one easy graph drawing um, idea is just put all the vertices on the outer rim of a disk and then connect them, but that generally leads to a large number of crossings for K5 and K33 that would lead to um, uh, five and I believe uh, three crossings. So if you want better crossings, sometimes you cannot do it that, um, that easily. So one specific question that motivated a lot of the work in this area that I was interested in was the so-called rectilinear crossing number, which is actually what we're doing here. You're placing the vertices and you're drawing the edges as line segments. This is sometimes called rectilinear or linear or geometric because you're not allowing curvilinear edges. The edges are drawn as straight uh, pieces as they're shown here. So in that case, given the graph, I can ask you what is the smallest number of crossings you can achieve for that graph. So for K5 and K33, the answer as shown here is you can do it with one. But even for the K88 up here, let's go back to that uh, picture. So there's the K88, right? Clearly this is not a straight line drawing. There's curved edges here, the, the outer edges. So those are not straight line. The ones in the middle are all straight line actually. But what's the fewest number of crossings you can achieve in drawing a K8, for example? Now that number is known, I don't know it off the top of my head, I think it's in the hundreds. Um, but what, what is the, um, how do you answer the general question? And then the, um, oops, there we go. Um, and then it actually uh, becomes even more interesting than that when you ask yourself, um, can you even decide the problem? Now, if you're a computer scientist, I hope you know what decidability or computability um, is. If not, this is the question of whether you can find an algorithm at all that answers the question. So even if you have algorithms background and ask you, how can I place the vertices of a graph up here? This is a K12, I believe. And this is actually an optimal drawing that minimizes the number of crossings. Uh, it looks uh, a little bit funny. Um, how, can you, how can you place the vertices to minimize the number of crossings? And you realize there, there is no promise on what type of resolution you need to draw the vertices, right? How, how, how far apart do they have to be? They could be extremely close together. You cannot a priori make any assumptions on that. So it's not clear that the problem is decidable. And this bugged me because in this book, this is a pretty well-known book with open research problems uh, by Brass, Moser and Pack. It's a beautiful book. But they asked whether the problem is in NP and I'm thinking, well, we don't even know whether it's decidable, right? Well, we actually do know that it's decidable. I'll tell you in a second why. But it's not, it's not obviously clear that it's decidable. Why would the problem even be in NP? Okay, so I've used some uh, dirty words, decidable and NP. So before we go on, my next topic will be um, logic and that with the logic, I will then introduce a bit of computational complexity, the third leg on which this presentation stands. This, if you've never seen it, is the proof that one plus one equals two in case you had any doubts. This is how Russell and White had proved it in the Principia Mathematica as a class theorem. So alpha and beta here are classes of unit size. If they have empty intersection, then the union has size um, two. This comes after, you see the numbering is in the 50s. This comes after about 200 pages, so it takes a while to prove. That's logic for you, right? You start with first principles and then developing things from first principles can get a bit tricky. We're not doing Principia Mathematica logic and I'll try to keep it a little bit uh, um, informal, but logic is a formal language and it's there so that you can write things down precisely. Why is this important? Well, many things we write down are just not particularly precise. So if you're slightly mathematically inclined and you look at all the formulas I collected here on this uh, slide, most of them will express certain thoughts to you, right? So for example, xy equals yx. Uh, anybody volunteer on what that expresses? Or I answer my own question. Commute, commutativity. Commutativity, very good. So this is clearly what we write when we want to uh, express that uh, that x and y commute with each other. And then if you recognize that, then you'll see that the x minus y times x plus y equals x squared minus y squared is just a binomial um, 
uh, form of the binomial theorem. Um, what about the n equals 2k plus 1? What does that express? That it is um, the odd number. That n is an odd number, right? So we write n equals 2k for even number, n equals 2k plus 1 for odd number. Um, so there's a lot of these formulas. Uh, this n up here equals 2 to the n means that n is a power of 2. This x squared equals minus 1 is a bit mysterious because x squared is supposed to be positive. So what does that mean? Uh, x squared equals 2 means that x is the square root of 2, probably. And this down here uh, means that n times m is 7. But n and m are bigger than 1. How is that possible? That should just be wrong, right? Because 7 is a prime number and cannot be written as the product of two numbers. So what does any of this mean? Well, we will toss out the formulas that are like the commutativity and the binomial theorem. These are really universally quantified, right? You, you want to say that these are true for any x and y. Whatever x and y is, x, y equals y, x, if you think, say, of the real numbers. So these I'm not interested in. I'm interested in the existential formulas where I want to say, for example, look at the n equals 2k plus 1. To say that n is odd, I say that there is a k such that n equals 2k plus 1, k is n over 2. So this is what the logician would call an existentially quantified formula. I don't have to quantify here explicitly. We'll see it on the next slide. Similarly, the nm equals 7. That would say there is an n and an m such that the product is 7. They're both bigger than 1. Epsilon bigger than 0 if you do proofs in calculus. This is always for all epsilon. So this would be universally quanti uh, quantified. So let's, uh, let's go uh, just drop those that are universally quantified. We're not interested in those. And here's the existential quantifier explicitly. This is the notation that uh, Russell and White had introduced. This is the upside down um, E for exists. So there is a n such that n equals 2 to the n, meaning uh, big N is a power of 2. Or there's a k such that n equals 2k plus 1, meaning that um, n is an odd number. Now, we're getting closer to formal logic. In formal logic, you write down formulas like that that follow certain semantic, uh, sorry, certain syntactical rules, a bit like a program, um, typically, though, flat in a line, not uh, in multiple lines. But then what we're interested in is truth. And when we talk about truth, we need to interpret the formulas. And suddenly, it makes a difference um, what domain we interpret these formulas over. So when I say, um, for example, there is an nm such that nm equals 7, n bigger than 1, m bigger than 1, you would probably want to say that formula is false, right? There are no such n and m because 7 is a prime number. We could not write it as a product of two numbers that are bigger than 1. But the formula is clearly true if you let n be 2 and m be 3.5, right? So who allowed me to use uh, uh, rationals or not? Well, it depends. Nobody uh, did this. But what's suggestive here is the names. n and m are typically integer values, like the exist k, n equals 2k plus 1. This is really only an odd number if k is an integer value. This is something, if you learn how to program, you often overlook. Verbal names are really important, and they carry a lot of meaning uh, implicitly. Um, this means an odd number only if k, and, uh, if k is an integer value. So there's a notion of a domain over which we interpret these formulas. Very often, mathematicians are sloppy and leave this uh, implicit, uh, but we would have to be precise and say what we mean. The domains that are interesting for this talk are uh, GF2, just uh, binary, 0 and 1, uh, in which case, for example, um, this would just mean that n is 1. 7 doesn't exist. Uh, x3 equals minus 1. Well, minus 1 is the same as 1, so this would say that x equals 1. Over z, over z, over the, so z is the symbol for the integers. Uh, there's a case such that n equals 2k plus 1 would mean that um, n is odd number, and then we could use a formula down like this here to express that 7 is composite. Over r, this changes. Over r, this formula down here would just be true. The second formula exists k, n equals 2k plus 1 would be true for any n. Um, there's next such that x squared is equals minus 1 is still wrong, right? That doesn't work over the real numbers. Uh, there is next such that x squared equals 2 is true over the real numbers. 
but we can't make it true over the um, integers. Over GF2, it's true again, because two is the same as zero, so zero squared is zero. So then that formula is true. So you see it matters what domains we use, and we could here go even farther to the complex numbers, then this formula becomes true again, or um, even further than that. Um, logicians like talking about the signature of a formula, that's the symbols you're allowed to use. So signature here that we'll be using will be zero, one, the variable names, arithmetical expressions plus minus times and comparisons like equals less than less than equal. So those are the tools with which we build our um, formulas. And then you can express some interesting things. For example, there is an x such that x squared equals x expresses um, what over the real numbers? x equals one. Or? x equals zero. Right, so it actually expresses an or, interestingly, right? So it's x equals zero, x equals one. Uh, there is an x such that x squared equals two, it's just um, uh, the square root of two. Uh, how can we write two with the signature we have? We can write two as one plus one. So two is just a defined term if you want. Um, um, writing there's an x such that y equals two x doesn't mean anything over the real number that's true for every y. Uh, similarly, this one here, such that this expresses that y is a square, that's only meaningful over z over, well, actually, it's meaningful over r2. Over r, what does this formula express? Y is positive. Y is more than, more than zero. Y, y is non-negative. That's exactly right. So if you look at something like 0 less than uh, equal y less than equals 2, that's the range from 0 to 2 in r. That includes the, uh, like, stuff like 1.5 or 0 0.7. Interestingly, even over r, we can define integers. Um, um, that's not actually true. We cannot define the integers over r as far as we know, but we can define some integers. So we can, for example, say there is an x1 and x2, such that x1 squared equals x1, x2 squared equals x2. So each one of them is 0, 1, and y is the sum of these two. So what this expresses here over r, is that y is 0, 1, or 2. Everybody see that? So even over the real numbers, I can define the integer 0, 1, 2. That works up to a fixed length. I cannot define arbitrary integers. Whether that can be done is open. But fixed small set of integers, I can certainly do. OK. I hope that wasn't too much logic. That's all the logic uh, you'll see. The next topic we're talking about is um, is computational complexity. If you've heard about this decidability or computability, Turing, uh, Church, Gödel may have played a role. Uh, I hope you've heard about NP, cohen P, P for polynomial time, PH is the polynomial hierarchy, CH, I promise you, most of you will not have heard of the cumulative hierarchy, and then P space is polynomial space. Uh, I'll not introduce all of them, but we will talk about a couple of them. So computational complexity is the question, how hard is it to solve a particular problem? <clears throat> and here, uh, for your benefit, I've actually classified a couple of problems that I hope you recognize. So uh, this one here is Sokoban. If you've never played it, play it. It's a fun and uh, difficult game. Sokoban is the janitor that's pushing the boxes into their locations. Um, it's a difficult game. Uh, rush hour may be familiar to you, that game up here. Turns out both of these problems are p-space complete. So they're hard for what's known as polynomial space. Then you may have heard about the, um, uh, the traveling salesperson, where you're trying to find the shortest route in a network of cities. And that is, I apologize that uh, I have the um, error here pointing at NP, but that is clearly wrong. Can I fix that? I'll, talk, I'll tell you a little bit later why that error cannot point into NP. If you think that traveling salesperson is NP hard, that, that's, that's true, but it's not in NP. Um, what else? Minesweeper, you may have, uh, well, it's at this point an ancient game. Uh, Minesweeper is uh, co NP complete. Um, uh, what else do we have? Uh, Oh, you give two drawings of a graph, are they the same graph? That's known as graph isomorphism. 
that's somewhere down here, or is a number, can a number be factored, like for RSA? How hard is it to factor a number that, le that lies somewhere close to graph isomorphism as far as we know? Satisfiability is a logical formula. Satisfiability is in NP. Tautology is a logical formula, always true, is in co-NP. If you have a Boolean circuit, evaluating the value of that is in polynomial time. So that's actually our notion of um, easy. Now, what are we actually doing? Uh, measuring complexity absolutely like this is um, difficult. The way we actually measure um, complexity is by comparing different problems and saying which one is easier, which one is harder. Imagine that you have um, um, you have two people that uh, run next to each other. You may not know how fast they're running, but you can see who's running faster, right? Or so you have two buildings next to each other. You may not know how tall either one of them is, but you can certainly tell which one is tall and which one is smaller. So often it's easier to compare problems by their complexity as opposed to, as opposed to measuring their complexity um, absolutely. Um, to do this, we need the notion of reduction, meaning we reduce one problem to another problem, we use one problem to solve another problem. And to introduce that notion, we need some, a notion of easy, what it means to be computationally easy, and that for us will be polynomial time. A thing of this is computer programs that run relatively fast. So matrix multiplication, searching a graph, basic computer programs, um, that run quickly, think of that as polynomial time. I'm not going to do the formal um, definition here. So then what is the reduction between um, two problems? So suppose you want to multiply two numbers. Multiplication is difficult. What can you do? You take the logarithm of both the numbers. You have log x and log y. You add them together. Addition is relatively easy. And then you just take that back. You exponentiate the result, and you get x times y. So you can solve multiplication very easily if you can do log and x quickly and you can do addition. You're probably not arguing that addition can be done very quickly. You may be arguing that uh, logarithm and exponential can be done very quickly, but uh, you can. Um, navigation worked because people knew how to do this quickly. When they were out on sea, they had to figure out where they're located. And that required a lot of uh, calculations like this. How did they do this? They had tables where they could look up the logarithms and the exponentials very quickly. And with that, they could do complicated uh, computations like this, multiplications, by reducing them to additions, which were relatively easy to do. Or in slightly more modern times, the slide rule, which you may or may not remember, is basically a way to reduce multiplication to addition, putting two things next to each other by length. So you're reducing the um, multiplication problem to the addition problem. So if you agree that logarithm and exponent exponentiation are easy, which I agree is a bit of a stretch, but you can make them practically easy if you want to, then computer scientists would phrase this as saying, multiplication reduces to addition. That means multiplication is no harder than addition because if you know how to solve addition, then with addition, you can solve multiplication. That's the basic idea behind reduction. Don't get confused by the word. The reduction sounds like you're making something smaller. You're not. Uh, reducing something to something else means translating and or rephrasing as a different type of um, problem. Let's see a problem here that uh, you may or may not have uh, encountered before. If I give you a graph like this graph here, you may be asked to color the vertices of the graph in such a way that the all edges have vertices of different colors at their endpoints. That's the graph coloring problem. To anticipate what's going to happen, that's an NP-complete problem, so it's a famous problem. Even figuring out whether the graph can be colored with three colors is, is difficult. So solving this problem, I give you a graph. Can you assign just three colors, red, blue, and uh, green, to all the vertices such that every edge has endpoints of two different colors? for large graphs is difficult. If you have a graph with hundreds of vertices, this is not something you write an easy algorithm for. Let me show you reduction though. I can rewrite this. Look, we have uh, 10 vertices here, right? I labeled them one through 10. So I can write this as saying, there is C1 through C10. Those are 10 variables, one for each vertex. 
And for each vertex, I say one is at most C1, is at most three. So each one of these um, um, 10 variables lies between one and three. That encodes the three colors, right? One for red, two for blue, and three for green. And then each edge is a restriction. For example, the fact that we have an edge between one and two means that the color for one needs to be different from the color for two. Okay. So, and you write down all of these conditions and you get a logical formula with extent for quantifiers, uh, 10 variables and a couple of conditions. So what I've shown you is, if somebody gives you a graph coloring problem, you can translate that into a problem of this type. Well, what is this type? This is sometimes called integer linear programming, ILP. There are solvers for this. One of the famous ones is IBM CPLEX. That's a professional package. You can pay good money for getting that. That's a, that's a powerful optimization package. So you can just feed it this formula and it's using whatever magic it's using. It's a very powerful solver to solve this problem. But the solution is you can, you can reduce three coloring to integer linear programming. And that means if you have an integer linear programmer and you can buy one, then you can solve your three coloring problem. I did the three coloring because it's easy, but any type of scheduling problem, like a couple of years ago, we, uh, we looked at actually scheduling classes for DePaul with all of the funny side constraints we have, like I can only teach on this day and that day. All of that's very easily encodable as an integer linear program, so you can very quickly get uh, determined class schedules based on running it through IBM CPLEX and we did back then. You can also encode it as a satisfiability problem. I'm not going to show that to you. You just have to use um, two Boolean formulas for each variable to encode uh, four different uh, colors. And uh, for SAT, that's actually a very popular error right now. There's a lot of different solvers out there. Minisat, uh, crypto Minisat I've worked with, written by some cryptographers. Um, because they deal a lot with Boolean um, computations. So you can actually translate this into a Boolean formula and then have it solved by crypto Minisat and you get your, uh, you get your coloring. What I'm interested in is a third translation where I take all of this and you see I built pretty much the same formula, but I want to work over the real numbers. How do I say over the real numbers that C1 is one, two, or three? Well, remember we saw this before, right? I have this trick where I say x1 square is x1, y1 square is y1, z1 square is z1. So that means x1, y1, z1 are either zero or one. If I add them up, then c1 is a number between zero and um, three. Zero and zero, one, Okay, now I confuse myself. They're all zero, then I get zero, they're all one, then I get three, that's one choice to many. So I'm actually encoding for colorability. Uh, we, need, uh, we need to adjust this. But you can express that C1 is a value between one and three, but this formula down here is not quite right. And then you have the same condition, but now you phrase this over the real numbers. And this is what I'm getting at in this talk, the so-called existential theory of the real numbers, where you're asking, are there real numbers that satisfy some conditions like this. There are solvers for that. They're a little bit fewer. Microsoft has one called Z3. That's a theorem prover that supports, uh, that supports working with, um, with uh, uh, real uh, numbers, um, arithmetic. Okay, so then when we go back to this, um, what we've actually seen, to see the three colorability problem here uh, that I said is an NP, um, we saw that uh, integer linear programming, which is quite a bit harder, uh, lies on top of that. And this is really what this is expressing here. We have different problems and they can reduce, be reduced to each other. For example, three coloring um, can be reduced to Minesweeper and satisfiability can be reduced to Minesweeper and vice versa. So we say they have the same complexity. Similarly, Sokoban and Rush Hour can be reduced to each other, so they have the same complexity. And uh, mine, um, Minesweeper or three coloring can be reduced to either one of these, so they're actually harder. They're piece space complete, but they, as far as we know, cannot be reduced to uh, backwards to three coloring, so they're suspected to be really harder than these problems down here. So we get a hierarchy of problems by what type of reductions are possible between the, um, between the problems. 
Um, this just as a quick introduction to as a quick introduction to um, complexity theory. Um, now let's talk about the, the main topic of the talk, the extensional theory of the reals. Uh, extensional theory of the reals is expressing uh, statements over the real numbers. So you have quantifiers that range over the real numbers, and then your conditions are basically polynomial conditions. That means you have addition, subtraction, uh, uh, multiplication, and equality, and less than. So this is the signature you're working with. And ETR, the extensional theory of the reals, is the set of all formulas in the signature that are true over the real numbers. Okay. Now, you could look at different domains. If you look at GF2, so if you restrict the quantifiers to just 0, 1 Boolean values, you get an NP-complete problem. You basically get Boolean satisfiability. If you restrict yourself to the natural numbers, so if all the quanti uh, quantifiers are required to give you natural numbers or integers, it's actually the same thing, the problem is undecidable. There is no algorithm and there will never be an algorithm that solves the problem. So suddenly complexity uh, breaks out, and, uh, it's like crazy. Extensity of the reals, we haven't actually talked about how hard it is. It's not obvious that it can be solved at all. How do you know what those real numbers are, right? We'll see in a second why that's difficult. Um, over the complex numbers, it turns out very counterintuitively, the problem becomes easier again. It lies in the second level of the polynomial hierarchies. So it lies in NP to the NP. Over the rationals, it's famously open. Uh, because we don't know how to define the rationals over the um, um, over the real numbers, uh, as far as anybody know, there's nothing. So, what that, for example, means when I asked you about the Rema direct linear crossing number, if you're asking whether the vertices can be placed at rational locations, then, as far as we know, that problem's complexity is open. So that actually makes it harder. So. What's the power of ETR? Uh, it expresses everything we've seen. It expresses the rectilinear crossing number, right? We can just, with the extensional quantifiers, figure out where the points go, and then you can write a simple polynomial that checks whether the lines cross, and then count the number of crossings. So this can be done as ETR. Euclidean uh, traveling salesperson can be phrased as an ETR problem. Satisfiability can be phrased as an ETR problem. Colorability, we actually saw, can be phrased as an ETR problem. So extensive uh, C of the reals is quite powerful. It encodes a lot of very natural um, problems. But it has a dark side. Um, I don't know if it's too much to ask, but can you read that top formula here? Do you know what that expresses? Anybody see? Are you talking about x x squared equals x? The whole formula. So this whole expression here expresses what? Uh, g is okay. So oh, y has to be one because y is one. That's correct. And then because and x is zero, and then z squared is so two. So it's it's g is is z positive? We don't know. So. It means that z is the square root of two, right? So yes. this formula expresses that z is the square root of two. So if you have existential quantification over the reals, even without allowing to, you can express that your number is the square root of two. So imagine trying to write an algorithm that decides truth. How do you get a handle on square root of two, right? You can't even write down the digit. It's, it doesn't have a um, um, closed expansion. Here's something that's even worse. Uh, this looks like maybe that has something to do with equality. So let's suppose we don't use equality. Well, how about we say x1 is less than 1 half? And you'll say, well, you didn't allow me 1 half. Well, I'll just say 2x1 is less than 1, right? So it's the same thing. So I'm cheating a little bit here. And then I say x2 is less than x1 square, xn, and so on, so on, until I get to xn is less than xn minus 1 square. So I can square n times. So any solution here we'll have an xn that has size two to the two to the minus, uh, that is of size two to the two to the minus n. So if you were trying to figure out whether this formula is true or not, and you were trying to do that by finding witnessing values for the x1 to the xn, you would have to look for the xn at a size of two to the two to the minus n. That's an exponential number of bits. 
because the number itself is double exponential. So the amount of precision is blown way out of uh, way out of the water, and it's not even clear that that's the end of it. Turns out it is, but that's um, that's a bit tricky to show. So um, at some point, I you know I kept going to talks and graph drawing, and I kept showing problems that to me very clearly had in common that they could be solved using the existential theory of the reals, uh, but also vice versa, that they were as powerful as the whole existential theory of the reals. So I introduced this complexity class called ER, and we saw it's as powerful as NP. It's probably much more powerful. And there's a non-trivial result due to Kenny that he proved in the late 80s, 90s, um, uh, in robot motion planning. Actually, he was interested in robot motion planning, things like the piano movers problem, moving a, moving an object through a terrain. He showed that the existential theory of the real can be decided in polynomial space. So there's an upper and a lower bound in it, but where exactly in the hierarchy it lies, we don't know. We say a problem is hard for the, um, for the um, class if it's, uh, if it's as hard as any problem in the class, if it's complete, it has to be hard for any problem in the class and lie in the class. Okay, so uh, actually before I did this, people without naming it explicitly already had identified several problems that are hard for this class. For example, if I give you polynomial or multinomial in many variables, can you find a zero of that multinomial? That problem is hard for the existential theory of the real. That's sometimes called the feasibility problem. Uh, we added to that uh, the, the Brouwer fixed point problem or maybe the Nash equilibrium problem. If you have a three player game, um, uh, does it have a Nash equilibrium in a certain neighborhood? Turns out being able to solve that is as hard as solving the full existential theory of the real. So think about what that means. Uh, if you had an existential theory of the real solver like Z3, you can solve this problem, but also vice versa. If there's something that can find these Nash equilibria, then you can solve any question in the existential theory of the reals. And uh, we, um, we showed that calculating the rank of a tensor is also as hard as the existential theory of the, um, uh, the reals. But what I'm mostly interested in is problems in geometry, so graph drawing. And I realized I'm running out of time. Tanu, how much time do I officially have? Uh, well, we go till, till if, if you end by two and you know, we'll have some questions after that. For 10 minutes th that would be good okay no i'll try to okay i'll um how about i, I want five ten minutes for questions so i'll go yeah. through this um um i'll just uh, skip all the proofs and i'll just show you a couple of the the pictures so the the original problem where this was um discovered the effect was um stretchability which is i give you a couple of lines like these here that go from negative infinity to plus infinity. Think of them as functions. And the question is, can they be stretched? Stretched means, can they be drawn as straight lines, like over here on the right-hand side, in such a way that they form the same arrangement? So the, the areas you get here, the regions you get, need to be the same over here. So they need to be the same regions as um, incident to the same lines. Can that be stretched? Not all uh, pseudo-line arrangements are stretchable. Famously down here is the Pappus arrangement. If you have, um, if you have uh, nine points like this in which the lines cross like this, this additional red line will have to pass through this uh, ninth point. That's the basic requirement of geometry. You cannot lie above or below. So if I make this arrangement by putting this line above or below, then I get a non-stretchable um, arrangement. So it's a non-trivial question. And what Niev showed uh, in 88 was that the problem is complete for the existential theory of the reals. He didn't have the language back then. Um, he called that something else. This is a universality theorem in mathematics. It's slightly differently aimed, but the result essentially gives this. This was reproved in a more CSC way by Shore in a much more readable paper in 91. Incidentally, the same Shore that gave us um, um, the quantum algorithm for factorization. And uh, the most readable version of it, if you're actually interested in reading the result, is in uh, lecture notes by Matuszek from 2014, where he wrote this um, um, up. Uh, even there, you can see that if you realize, if I give you a line arrangement like, uh, a pseudo line arrangement like this, and you have to realize it, you can very easily see, this is the picture from Goodman Pollock Stromfeld's uh, paper, that, uh, 
with just a couple of lines, actually just four lines, you can go from a point A to point A squared, so you can square the coordinates. And if you do this n times, you get to two to the n, so you have coordinates of power two to the two to the n. So in a realization of such a pseudoline arrangement, uh, you may need uh, precision of order two to the two to the minus n, which of course is tiny, which means it's not very practical. Then the rectilinear crossing number that I mentioned earlier on Beanstalk also showed in 91, again, without having the language, but that's essentially what he did. He showed that uh, determining that number is as hard as solving the existential theory of the reals. So given the graph, finding the smallest crossing number is exactly as hard as solving existential theory of the reals type questions. Here's a couple of other ones, unit disk graphs, which are graphs that are obtained from um, unit disks in the plane uh, intersecting each other. So any graph that can be written as such an intersection graph is called a unit disk graph, recognizing them as existential theory of the real um, heart. I'll skip the proof. I was going to show you how to do this from scratch with the collinearity problem, but uh, we don't really have time to go into the depth. Um, one interesting ingredient uh, that comes up is, is um, a device from 19th century projective uh, geometry, the so-called von Staudt constructions, that essentially geometrically allow you to do arithmetic. So uh, you may remember from high school geometry that there are certain constructions that, that um, where the height of a triangle under certain conditions is the square of one of the sides. So there's general, there's general devices that allow you to add two points or to multiply two points. And as you combine them, you can get them to calculate arbitrary polynomials. And that's how they can mimic the existential theory of the reals. The problem is a little bit, um, can get a little bit uh, complex. One um, problem I added was the so-called linkage realizability, where you're given a graph and you specify the length of the edges in the graph. So given a graph, given edge length, can you draw the graph so that the edge lengths are actually realized? So in data science, that could be an interesting uh, problem. And it actually had been studied there and is known as the Euclidean, Euclidean Distant Matrix Completion Problem, EDMCP, for various uh, settings. But in general, it turns out the problem is hard for the extensity of the real, so very difficult to solve, even if all the length are one. So even if you require all the edges to have length one, which is very simple, Given a graph, asking whether it can be realized like that is, uh, is tricky. The, I can't show you the construction, but it's kind of cute because it uses something called the Posselier linkage, which is the linkage you see here. If all of these pieces have the same length one, this linkage can move and it turns rotary motion into, um, into straight line motion. Apparently, um, Lord Calvin was so fascinated with this when he discovered this that he played the whole day, uh, spent the whole day playing with this. Um, this is at the root, of course, as mechanical robots, uh, like the, this was on the opening slide, the Jacques Ross um, uh, robot, and Kemp's universality theorem, the same Kemp who gave us the wrong proof of the four color theorem. Um, the proof of this result was also wrong, but it could be fixed without uh, quite as much effort as the four color theorem. Um, he basically showed if you have a polynomial, then all the zeros of that polynomial in a small compact area can be traced by a linkage. If you think of a linkage as, what's a linkage is a graph with fixed uh, edge length. So it's like the pieces of a robot. What this is saying, any, any curve in the plane can be traced by a robot. That would be the popular reading of, um, of this. And at the core of it is how to draw a straight line, just like using the posterior linkage, but you can get any curved, um, any curve, any polynomial curve. There's, in the meantime, since um, since we published the initial papers uh, naming the class, uh, identifying the class, there have been a lot of additional uh, results showing that problems are complete for this um, class. My um, favorite ones among those are the art gallery problem. If you've ever seen the art gallery problem, you're giving a polygon and you're asking for the smallest number of guards that are necessary so that every point in the polygon can be seen by the guards. Turns out that's hard for the existential theory of the reals. And then recently, my really most favorite problem was, um, I don't know whether you've seen this for 
um, error problem. That's a cute packing problem. You get this wooden box with the four errors and you have to put them inside. Um, there's many versions of these. These are known as packing puzzles. You have some shape into which you have to put a lot of other shapes. Um, turns out the question whether you can do this is also hard for the extensibility of the reels. And what that means is that there are solutions that require double exponential, uh, exponential precision in their realization. So it turns out, um, it turns out this is, um, these are difficult problems to solve. There are other problems for which the complexity is not yet known, like the finding the largest rectilinear crossing number, uh, Lombardi uh, drawings or um, RRC graphs, the ones I mentioned earlier where all the crossings have to be rectilinear down. This one here shows that the K33 has a drawing in which all the crossings are at right angles. But in general, it's not known how hard it is to decide that. Suspicion is that it's hard for the existential theory of the, of the reels. And I think that's pretty much as uh, much time as a, um, as much as I have time for at this point. If you do have additional questions, I have one or two more slides that may be uh, interesting to show. But for right now, let me just say thank you. Thank you, Marcus. I will open up for questions. I missed something on the last uh, slides, I think. You were mentioning three problems. Uh, are you saying that these problems, you don't know if they're solvable in the existential theory of the reals? No, they, they all are. are? They all are, but the question is whether they're as hard as the existential theory of the reals. So, so typically, encoding in the existential theory of the reals is not uh, is you know it's it's just like encoding in satisfiability. Once you're familiar with it, it's it's relatively straightforward. Doing the hardness proofs is typically the hard part. So that theory feels natural for graph drawing. Like, does there exist positions that satisfy some some properties? So are there some natural graph drawing problems that do not fit in the existential theory of the reals? So one way to go beyond it is by um, having notions that are uh, require more quantifiers. They would then go into, you know, beyond the existential theory of the reals, you can build a hierarchy. Um, of, uh, you know, for all exist quantification. So I know in Berlin, there was a group of people looking at area universality, which is asking if you have a graph, um, can it be realized for all possible areas? So you, you specify for each region how, what the area is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. um, and that problem actually is hard for the second level, turns out. So certainly you can go beyond that then any anytime you quantify over Q, over the rationals, if you want a rational solution, mm. then then you, you go beyond the extensive theory of the reals. Now, uh, I said earlier on for rectilinear crossing number, that's a problem. It's not, I misspoke. For the rectilinear crossing number, if you, if you have an optimal solution where you place the, sorry, I should actually, uh, I'm, I'm gesturing and <laughs> you can't see me. If for the, um, um, for the, um, rectilinear crossing number, you're placing the points in some locations, and then you measure the crossing number. If you modify the points slightly, that doesn't change the rectilinear crossing number. So there, getting a rational solution is uh, is always possible if there's a real solution. But uh, I've seen problems, and I don't remember exactly what it was, where you really quantify just over the rationals, where you want a rational solution. And once you have equality in your conditions, then that is not known to be even decidable. So. Uh, yes, you can uh, you can go beyond that. Yeah, thank you. But it is a very powerful theory. This is why yeah, yeah. the Z3 prover is not particularly efficient because um, even for um, I think somebody tried using it to find solution to some geometric problems to six or seven variables, and even then it just blew up. Uh, um, uh, the, the techniques known, things like quantifier elimination, tend to um, blow up the formulas exponentially for each variable. So you can only do this so often before you get out of bounds. Thank you. Uh, what, uh, <laughs> you mentioned that the Lombardi way of drawing graphs uh, is gaining popularity and I see it was on the slide that you were just showing. Uh, mm -hmm. What's kind of seen as the advantages of that way of drawing graphs? Good question. That would be a question for David Epstein, who invented the model. Um, 
uh, he's very interested in um, aesthetic drawings. So I think uh, the um, if if I go back to the slide, uh, he bases Lombardi is an Italian um, artist, as I recall, and uh, he based the the, the notion, Epstein based the notion on on this artist's drawing where where all the curves are um, angled. So one thing you can even see in this drawing here, as you look at one of, I don't know, is this large enough for you to see? Yes. Okay, if you look at one of the vertices here, if we had straight lines here, the resolution at this vertex, uh, by resolution you mean the angle between uh, neighboring edges, mm -hmm. uh, can be pretty bad. But by having um, the lines curved, you can actually make the resolution such that all the angles at this vertex are even. As you see how the curves enter this vertex, they all kind of enter not quite at the same angle, but pretty close. In a straight line drawing, that's pretty impossible. You'll have very small angles, you'll have very large angles. But here, by, by um, changing the angle, let's say, look at this vertex here, we have three angles of um, uh, 120 degree, right? Mm. That you can make it very pleasurable to look at. And large angle resolution is typically considered to be good for readability of a drawing. So I would argue aesthetic and uh, readability of drawings would probably be what Epstein would say. But uh, if you look for Lombardi drawings or Lombardi planarity, you'll find papers by that group and they will probably motivate it better than I can. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Yeah, because I can see it looks like the like it's not an accident, probably the curve was chosen such that the angles match. So you probably yes. have- Yes, yes, I would think so. I think that's what Lombardi does. It's not always possible, but yes, mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, Marcus, my, my question is that, uh, so, so these are trying to find exact solutions in which we are uh, determining that, well, it's undecidable and, and one cannot solve the problem. But, but what are good approximate solutions uh, for this? And what are those algorithms based on? So for many of these, this is open. So there, there was a paper recently um, that actually looked at the existential theory of the reals mm -hmm. and looked at approximation for that. But now you have to ask yourself, what does it mean to approximate the existential right. theory of the reals? approximating the rectilinear linear crossing number, you could say, well, I'm okay if it goes up by a factor of two or a hundred, that, that's okay. I'm still okay with that. I don't think anybody knows uh, how that affects the complexity, whether there are good solutions. So in that area, people typically just come up with heuristics and uh, say they, they start with a convex drawing and then they move vertices around that in a way typically greedily reduces the number of crossings. Maybe there's also some AI at it. But uh, for many of these problems, there is no um, good theoretical results on how well they can be approximated. Um, mm -hmm. And inapproximate, inapproximability results are very weak. Uh, so you cannot show for many that they are hard to approximate. Um, so at best, I think at this point, heuristics, but there, there have been one or two papers about approximating the extension theory of the reals. And there was one problem. Uh, there's one paper which actually showed that for some large class of graph drawing problems, um, most problems actually don't run into the precision issue, but most was basically random. Um, uh, so if you pick a problem at random, it doesn't have that uh, issue. But, you know, picking a problem at random is not the type of problem you run into when you actually do it. So that, that is a theoretical result more than a practical result. Okay. I have a question. So, so I didn't catch the formal definition of uh, existence for real. Of the the theory. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I didn't know which, like, what was the complexity? Like, for example, like MP, like a compl complexity of that. Yeah. So. Um, yes, actually, I have a slide. Oh. On that, but for some reason, hold on, it's. That's why I drew this picture here. So, um, so I didn't actually show that picture. So there's P space up here. Remember the um, Sokoban and rush hour are hard for the class polynomial space. So those are algorithms that take a polynomial amount of space down here, polynomial time, 
Then here's NP, so problems like satisfiability, and here core NP like um, totality. Then the extensive theory of the reals includes all of NP, and then we don't know. So the way I drew it here is just a suspicion. Why? Because there is a problem, the, the sum of square roots problem, which is, um, maybe let me just quickly show this. Um, uh, I had these extra slides. Uh, if I ask you a question like this, a square root of three plus square root of five less than square root of seven, how hard is that? You can say, well, I'll just compute it. But then the question is how many um, digits do you need to compute? And what if you say had more terms like that? And it turns out this problem is, uh, if you look at them, they're actually the same up to um, up to the tenth digit or so. We don't actually know uh, exactly what precision we need before we can decide something like that. So algebra is not good enough to give us the answer even to this. And this problem here, deciding something like this, is a tiny, tiny, tiny subproblem of the extension theory of the reals. So with the extension theory of the reals, you'll be able to decide this. Uh, but it's very, very low in the extensive theory of the reals. This is the sum of square roots problem, um, well-known problem, well-known open problem. And that was recently placed up here in the cumulative hierarchy, which is very, very high up. So complexity-wise, much closer to P space than it is to NP. And again, this is a tiny, tiny subproblem of uh, the extensive theory of the reals. So my suspicion is that it goes higher up into P space but we don't know. Like it misses things, like core and P is not contained in there. Uh, so it is kind of one side, this is on the existential side. Um, but I, my co-author on several of these papers, he thinks that all of this just collapses down to NP. That's possible. Mm -hmm. That's not impossible. Um, that's what, if you remember the original question from the research book on the rectilinear crossing number, they asked whether this problem here is in NP and really what they're asking is whether all of these problems, difficult problems from computational geometry, from calculus, whether all of these problems can be placed into um, NP. And the answer is we just have no idea how to do this. The, the algebraic geometry uh, is too difficult. Nobody knows how you do anything like that. So my suspicion would be the problem goes, goes up way into P space, even beyond the cumulative hierarchy, but we don't know that for sure. But so, it is decidable, so you can write algorithms to solve it. It is an exponential time, for example. So isn't it like if the if the sum of square root is like ch, like we, we have proved that we have proved that like the like existence exists. It's before. it's in ch. So that's the best upper bound they found. They didn't prove it's hard for ch. So the sum of square root problems, for all we know, could still be done in polynomial time. So they didn't prove that it's hard for CH. This is the best upper bound. So they found an algorithm that lies in CH that decides the sum of square roots. Yeah. So that the argument here is more, it's not a fully mathematical argument. It's saying a tiny little subproblem of the extensive theory of the reals required all of these resources. But it's not, oh. we don't know for sure that all of these resources are really required but that's the best people have been able to do so far. It's in the third level of the cumulative hierarchy. So way beyond the polynomial hierarchy, which is way beyond NP and co -NP. Does that make sense? Well, if that's the case, it's not in a P space, right? Uh, no, all of this lies in P space. The cumulative hierarchy lies in P space. Right, right, right. Cumulative hierarchy, like uh, if you can solve it with a cumulative hierarchy, that some of the square root can be solved in a cumulative hierarchy, then then it's like- the, the It lies in P space. You can solve it in P space. You can. Oh, okay. Which is funny because the precision you need may go beyond polynomial precision. So you will not be able to write witnesses down precisely. So you, this, this sum of square root expression, like you may be able to decide which one is larger you will not, because you only have polynomial space, you will not be able to compute either one of these expressions exactly to the point where they differ most likely, because you only have polynomial space, which may not be enough, but it can be done. So that just means there's another algorithm that uses different uh, ways of doing it that doesn't use the decimal representation to do it. Let's see, okay. It's, I agree, it's a bit counterintuitive, yes, but that can, that can happen. It doesn't happen that often, but yeah, the, um, 
it's, it requires a different approach. The witnesses are too large to be written down in peace space. I see. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Uh, I guess. Actually, I just have one final question. This may be <laughs> like naive, Marcus. So you mentioned that some of the problems to do with crossing numbers were undecidable, but presumably since they since those graphs were completely innumerable, where does the undecidability creep in? Creep in? So that one, sorry, that one is the one I took back. That's okay, one when, when I said for the, the rational coordinates. Um, no, uh, um, so for, um, um, completely innumerable, but I mean, yes. Yeah, so, so, so I mean, the, the, uh, we know now they are decidable, but it's still not obvious because while you can completely enumerate the like, um, yeah, all like the, the uh, you can combinatorially enumerate them, yeah. you still don't know whether they're realizable or not, right? So that's that. That was the pseudo line arrangement problem, whether whether this topological realization can be realized with straight lines. That's a difficult problem. Oh, okay. Now we know that's yeah. decidable. Mm -hmm. um, so what the Goodman, Pollock, and Stromfels proved is that for anything that falls in the ETR, extensity of the reals, okay. um, double exponential precision is actually good enough. So if you try with that, mm -hmm. it'll it'll work. So if there's a solution, you will find it if you look that far down. Okay. But you need to look very far down. So very far down. Yes. Okay. So that makes sense. Yeah, I was just wondering about wondering wondering about the that whole question of, of decidability on that. So. so that actually, I mean, I think it does happen once occasionally, but it's relatively rare because we have finite objects. So uh, th there are, I think, undecidable problems on these, but yeah, that's, that's rare. That's a rare okay. effect. Great, thank you. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thank, thank you. you.